I'd like to invite your attention back to Colossians chapter 3. I want to give you a little bit of a recap. It's been a couple of weeks. Um, where we've been, where we're going, the overall arching storyline that we are following in the book of Colossians. The theme of the book is that our identity is found in Christ. Christ in us is our hope of glory. We talked about how we, we try to find glory in a lot of other things. We put our hope of glory maybe in our jobs, our family, our place we live, our reputation, something that we accomplish. We hope to gain some kind of glory through all of that. But really and truly, the only hope that we have of receiving glory, seeing glory, experiencing glory in our life, it is as believers and followers of Jesus, it is that presence of Jesus in our life. If there's one truth that I think we could totally change the way we live, it is if we come to grips every day and constantly during the course of a day what it means that Jesus died and rose again and redeemed us. That it wasn't just our past sins being forgiven, although that, that's awesome. And it's not just that when we die, we'll go to heaven, although that's awesome and great. But the in-between... The fact that God could take us from where we are and could assure us heaven guarantees he must be able to take care of everything in between. Because if he could not guide our life, everything in between being born again and dying, he couldn't promise that he would deliver us in death if there would be something in between that would take us out of his hands. We come to grips with that fact that can change our life. Paul in Philippians 2 told the Philippians to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. He didn't mean to work for it. He meant to work because of it. Because they had salvation, to put it to work. To, to let it affect their daily life. That it mattered on their jobs, it mattered in their families, it mattered in their neighborhoods. It, it mattered as much, maybe even more so, on Monday morning than it meant on Sunday morning. And the reason he said is because God is at work in you. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God is at work in you. If you don't remember anything else from this message today, I hope you'll remember that phrase. God is at work in you. We come to Colossians as Paul's developing this theme for the church in Colossae, reminding them what it means to have Christ in our life. Not just for our past or for our future, but for today. We looked at kind of a pivotal point the beginning of chapter 3, where he told us to set our affections and to seek things that are above, not things that are earthly, to, to recognize that we, we live for a higher purpose. And he told us that, our, 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 that we have died, but our, our life is hidden with Christ in God. And that when Christ appears in all of his glory, we'll receive glory with him. Then he begins to make it practical. He talked about the things we need to put away. The life changes. The Holy Spirit wanted to bring about how the old us he wanted to put away. And we talked about the new things he wanted to come. Then he started getting really personal. Because he moved from just kind of that theoretic attitude stuff to what kind of husbands we are, and what kind of wives we are, and what kind of parents we are, and what kind of children we are. And he got very specific about how Christ at work in us produces a very definite way of that. Well, now he takes it a step further, and he recognizes that even beyond the family unit, in our everyday life, there are some practical ways, and that's what the, the main point, the focal point of the message is today, is that, that our identity in Jesus allows us to live in ways that point people to Jesus every day. 
So we're going to look at four of those that he outlines for us in the Scripture and kind of break that apart and, and see how may it be that the Lord is working in your life in that way. Well, notice, first of all, one, the first area that he talks about seeking the things that are above, not things of the earth, to carry that theme through to the end of the chapter. He talks about bond servants, obeying in everything, those who are your earthly masters. And down in a few verses, the beginning of chapter 4, masters, how they treat their bond servants. Now, we have a different system today. Understand that even in this system, a bond servant, a very unique term in the New Testament. Uh, it not even like, you know, when we think of somebody being a slave, we have this very tainted view of, of the awful blight that slavery was in our country where people were actually kidnapped and drawn away from home against their own will and forced to work in places away from their home treated as less than human. That's not the way slavery worked in the New Testament. For the most part, slavery was either a a lot most of the time was a voluntary thing because a person had gotten themselves into so much trouble or so much debt, the only way they could get out of it was to sell themselves to someone else. Now, there were some cases, you think about in the life of Joseph. Joseph was kidnapped and sold into slavery. But for the most part in the New Testament, when we see bond servant, we talk about somebody being a slave or a servant, it's talking about an indentured servant. And when it's talking about masters, it's talking about those who have those indentured uh, individuals working among them and working for them. But I want us to draw some concepts, some principles from this for how it relates to our life in 21st century America as it relates to work. Now, some of you aren't in the workforce anymore. Some of you have retired. Um, and, and so I understand. If you'll just be patient, we'll, we'll, we'll get you in a category in just a moment. Uh, but for those of us that still work in the workaday world, uh, we are kind of like the, you know, what is it, the seven dwarfs in um, Snow White? I owe, I owe. I mean, no, that's not what they said, was it? Uh, hi ho, hi ho, so off to work I go. Uh, we may sing, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. So, how is it that we can reflect this relationship with Christ? on the job. Notice what he says, three principles that we'll draw from this. Uh, let's go back to the, to the scriptures. Look in chapter 3 and verse 22. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as you are reward, your reward. Why? Because you are serving the Lord Christ. Three principles real quickly that I think may make your Monday morning at work maybe a little better, a little more tolerable, but hopefully will make you a little more gospel-oriented in your job. First of all, remember this. Jesus is your ultimate boss, your ultimate master. It doesn't matter where you work. It doesn't matter what, a super, what supervisor you may have. Ultimately, Jesus is the one who is in charge of your life. And so whatever work you do, you really are, are working for him. And, and so that second principle that we see, because Jesus is your ultimate master, your work actually is an offering to the Lord. That's why Paul encouraged him to work heartily as to the Lord. You do your best on your job. You, you try your hardest. You, you fulfill all that you need to fulfill on your job, not because you're trying to please your boss, and not just because you want to get a raise, or not because, you know, you just kind of love your job so much. Those are all okay things. It's good to want to please your boss. It's good to get a raise. It's, it's good to enjoy what you do. But, but ultimately, your motivation for the work you do is that God has blessed you with this opportunity to work in this place in order to provide for you and for your family. And so the way that you show God thanks for what he has provided is that you give it all you've got. You work heartily. You put your heart into it. You leave nothing behind at the end of the day. You don't cut corners. You don't cheat. You don't look for the least that you can get away with 
and still do your job. You go over and above. You, you work hard at that. So Jesus is your ultimate boss. Your work is an offering to him. And the third principle we get from our work that we need to understand is that Jesus ultimately is your provider and your rewarder. From the Lord you will receive an inheritance because you serve the Lord Christ. You may get a paycheck on payday. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a big difference on a paycheck in where your name is on the paycheck. If your name is on the top line, that's one thing. If your name is in the bottom right-hand corner, that's something altogether different. It's your job. It's your place then. It's your, you know. Of course, that comes with, with that comes a lot of responsibility and a lot of worry and a lot of pressure. But if you get that paycheck, it's easy for you to think that your job provides for you. As Christians, we need to understand that Jesus provides for us. He may use that job to do it, but even if that job were to fail you, or even if that job proves to be insufficient, he will not leave you without provision because you're his. Remember, he's getting you from born again to heaven, so he's handling everything in between. He is going to provide, but he is also going to reward. You see, when you work on days that you just don't feel like going, you just don't feel like showing up that day. And you certainly don't feel like dealing with those people. You ever had one of those days? Just don't feel like dealing. And those people may be the people that come in, or those people may be the people that are already there when you get there. But you do it anyway. Why? Because God has provided this for you. And you give it your best in spite of what's going on around you. You try the hardest and you, you do it with all of your might. Jesus takes note of that. And one day when you get to heaven and you stand before him and he's laying out your life and he's talking about the good that you have done, some of those good things are going to be, you know what, you remember that day? And you may have long forgotten that day at work when you just really didn't feel like dealing with it that day, but you, you did anyway. You asked God for grace, and you went, and you did. He enabled you on that day. He's going to bring that to mind and say, I saw what you did. That was awesome. Here's a little extra reward for that. You may be looking for a little something in your paycheck here on earth, but he's got a little something extra in your crown when you get to heaven. And eventually, you're going to spend that paycheck. You're going to pay bills with it, or you're going to throw it away on something that you probably didn't need one way or the other. But that crown, you're going to be able to lay at the feet of Jesus as an act of worship. It'll give you even more to be able to worship Him. So we understand our work reflects the gospel of Christ. Now, let me just take a moment and say, if you are a leader on a job, you are accountable also for how you lead those under your care. In chapter 4 and verse 1, masters, treat your bondservants justly. You could say, bosses, supervisors, treat those under you in two ways, justly and fairly, knowing that you also have somebody that you're accountable to. You're going to be held accountable one day to God for how you treated those who worked with you. First of all, to treat them justly. That's to treat people the right way, according to what God would have you do. To be godly to them. To exercise godly righteousness on the job. To do right, to be right, to, to be a Christian as a boss. That's a kind of a, a vertical goodness. Treating, a vertical, uh, treating them good in a vertical way. But they said treat them fairly. That means... Treat them equally. Be fair to each person. That brings it to an individual basis. Don't show favoritism to one or don't, don't neglect another because you just don't like them or they're just, you know, their personality rubs you the wrong way, you know, or whatever the case may be. Treat people fairly. That's a horizontal goodness. That's an equity across the board. So do right and be fair. That's how we reflect the gospel in our work. That's how our identity of Jesus 
uh, in Jesus plays itself out at work. We work hard. We recognize that we're, we're not working for the man. We're not working for the paycheck. We're working for Jesus because he's watching what we're doing, and he will provide, and he will reward. Secondly, we see that our identity in Christ also affects our praying. Look in chapter 4, verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Sometimes when you're reading through your scriptures and you're reading through the letters of Paul, get your notepad, and every time Paul talks about thanks, giving thanks, or thanksgiving, write that down on your notepad and put the reference by it. And by the time you read through the letters of Paul, count how many times Paul talks about thanksgiving. Paul overflowed with thanksgiving, and it was a theme in everything that he taught. So continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving, and at the same time pray for us, those, that was Paul and his entourage, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. As we talk about our prayers, our prayers can be gospel prayers. Three encouragements I think Paul gives us here for praying. First of all, pray consistently. He says, continue steadfastly. Pray a lot. Be a person of prayer. I've said this before, and those of you that come to the prayer study will hear it again tonight, but there's a difference in praying and saying a prayer. I don't want us to be people who say prayers. I want us to be prayers, people who pray. That it's just a natural flow from our life, this ongoing conversation that we have with God. And that's what Paul is encouraging these Colossian Christians to, to constantly pray. But not just praying constantly, praying uh, from an awareness, being watchful. Look at what's going on in the world around you. Look at what's happening to people around you. Pray for them. Pray for situations. Uh, I call these pop-up prayers. When, you, when, when, when you're driving down the road and a, a sheriff's deputy drives by you with the lights on, pray for that deputy. Pray for the emergency he may be going to. Pray a prayer of thanksgiving that you were going the speed limit. <laughs> and it's not you that we're in trouble. Or you hear, you see an ambulance or a fire truck go into a call. Pray for the people who are responding and pray for the situation they respond to. You drive by a school. Pray for the leaders and teachers in that school. Pray for the students in that school. Pray for the families in that school. Or you drive by a church, even not your own. Pray for that church that, that, that the gospel would grip the people in that church. And that they would shine the light of Jesus in whatever they do. I mean, why is that? that's just some examples. That's being watchful in our prayer. Or when you hear somebody mention something, just in a casual conversation, the Lord may flip a switch. That's something you're going to need to pray for. Pray for them. You don't even have to let them know you're praying for them. In fact, one of the coolest things in the world is to pray regularly for somebody they never know you're praying for them. And then you come back later and find out something happened in their life, and they wonder how that happened. And you just kind of can smile and go, yeah, I wonder. I wonder. Praying not to get credit for ourselves, but, you know. So pray with an awareness, and then pray thankfully. Say thank you to God often. How often do we ask God for something and he answers our prayer exactly the way we wanted it and then we just kind of go on about our business? You know, if somebody treats you that way, if you do something nice for somebody and they just take it and run with it and go, it kind of feels bad. You know, you, know, you could have at least taken a moment to say thank you. But what about us? So pray thankfully. Pray consistently. Pray with an awareness. Pray thankfully. And let me just add a word, because he talks about praying for leaders. And I want you to understand this, because this is kind of the rub of it all. Consistent, thankful prayer is one of the means that the Holy Spirit uses for our sanctification, our sanctification, our spiritual growth. Our, our praying, consistent, thankful praying the Holy Spirit uses that to grow us more, to be more like Jesus. So here's the rub. If you aren't consistently praying, you aren't growing spiritually. 
All right, there is no super pill that you can take to grow. There, there is no magic vitamin. It's spiritual discipline. And so I encourage you to make prayer, conversing with God, such a constant flow of your life. Now, how can you pray for me? Three things he mentions here. First of all, pray for opportunity. He says, pray that, a, uh, that God may open a door for the word. Now, as a pastor, one of the things, I, when I think about an, an open door for the Word, I'm not talking about on Sunday mornings. I don't think about it because, I mean, you kind of come expecting a sermon. You may get, I may overfill your expectations and give you way more sermon than you expected or wanted, but you kind of expect, I'm talking about as I talk to people during the course of the day, how can the Word of God nourish their life? How can I speak the Word of God into their life, into a situation they may face? Because honestly, I've got no, nothing I have to say is of any value apart from what God has said. And if God is the ultimately the one who is guiding us from born again uh, to glory, then what He said is what matters most. So pray that God would give me growth in my knowledge of His Word and wisdom in knowing how to apply that Word an open door for that word in your life and and in the lives of others that I come around. Pray that I would have focus. He says, pray that God would open us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. My, My goal, my desire, what I ask God to help me do is to be able to show people from God's word how in Christ matters for their life. That's why Colossians is my favorite book of the Bible. How listening to what Christ has said and living what Christ has said and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in me in ways I can't do on my own, how that, that means spiritual growth in my life. So pray that God would keep me focused in what I say, that it would be a gospel focus. And then clarity. Make it clear how I ought to speak. Help me to be able to communicate truly what God wants communicated to get the gymness out of it and to get the godness in it so that it's clear and compelling. All right, so that's how our identity in Christ affects our praying. We see also, though, and this is where it starts getting a little harder, our identity in Christ affects our actions. Look in verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders making the best use of their time. Now, when he talks about walk, he's talking about our daily life. Walk in wisdom, live. It's talking about as you walk around, as you, you do your, as you do you during the course of the day. You know, we got this popular saying, people say, well, you do you and I'll do me. How about we all do Jesus? You know, when I do me, I go astray. So what Paul is saying, walk in wisdom, As you do you, let you do be wise. And what is wisdom? Well, wisdom is not just knowing stuff. Wisdom is knowing what to do with what you know. It doesn't do you any good to know something if you never do anything with it. We call that trivia. Let me ask. Do any of you know somebody who is really good at trivial pursuit? Raise your hand. How many of you remember the game Trivial Pursuit? All right, let me ask you this. Are you impressed with them because they're so good at Trivial Pursuit? In fact, it's a little aggravating, isn't it? It's a little aggravating that they know these questions that really don't matter in life. How much of what we know is stuff that we never really put into practice? We're wanting to learn something new when we are not already applying what we know. I forget what one of the old preachers, probably sounds like something that Vance Havner would say, so it might have been him, said, we are educated beyond our obedience. We already know more than we're doing. So to walk in wisdom is to put into practical use what we know as we live our life. Toward outsiders, toward unbelievers, they need to see that. And, and, and he uses a great expression at the end of that verse, making the best use of time. Can I just be honest and tell you that one of the greatest battles I have in my life is time. And if I'm going to be real honest about it, part of it is that if I'm not careful, I tend to want to waste 
time on stuff that really doesn't matter because it's fun. Because, and sometimes I can make it sound noble. I'm researching something. Google has messed so many of us up and caused so many of us to waste time. We can Google anything now and start to find stuff. Making the best use of your time. Now, time here is the word kairos, which means opportunity. So what I'm trying to learn to do is to, instead of thinking in terms of time management, I'm trying to learn to think in terms of opportunity management. Am I making the most of this opportunity in this moment to do the most important thing in this moment of time? Am I optimizing this moment that way? You see, the best witness to the world about the life-changing power of the gospel is for the world to see the gospel demonstrated in our life. To see us knowing the truth of Scripture, living the truth of Scripture, even as we struggle. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It means that we are, we are struggling to know and we're struggling to do what God has told us to do. Our identity in Christ means that because we have the Holy Spirit in us, we have the author of the book who is able to help us understand not only what the book says, but what the book calls us to do. And not only does he have the ability to help us understand what the book calls us to do, here's the best part, the Holy Spirit has the ability to enable us to do what the book says if we ask him to help us do. That's why for me, like I said, with time management, it's become a spiritual issue. I ask the Holy Spirit to captivate my mind, to captivate my heart, to keep me on track, to keep me on focus, to help me realize the opportunity that is right in front of me at the moment. And when the world begins to see us living that way, to walk in wisdom, and they see us walking a practical gospel life, then they'll hear the gospel. Then finally, our identity in Christ should affect our words. Now buckle your seatbelt, because if you breezed through this, and I haven't hit you yet, we've all got a big bullseye on us right now, okay? Me included. This is the hardest part of the passage. But our identity in Christ changes the way we use our words. Look at verse 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. There's some hot words in there we need to pull out and give us some principles. The first thing we see when it comes to our words, well, let me say this on the outset. This may come as a shock to some of you younger folks. I can't believe I'm old enough now to talk to you younger folks. Come to some of you younger folks. The New Testament, they didn't have cell phones. They didn't text. They didn't have email. I don't even know that they used smoke signals <laughs> in the New Testament. Their primary way, and really their only way of communicating, they could write letters and they could talk. But talking was their main communication. I know it, it, it's, it happens in my life, it happens in yours. You'd be sitting together in a room of people, you've all got your phones, and you want to communicate to somebody across the room instead of saying something to them, you send them a text. I mean, we all do that from time to time. Okay? I get it. So, when we see the word speech, understand we're not just talking about what comes out of our mouth. We're also talking about the words that our fingers produce on keypads and keyboards. We're talking about our texting. We're talking about our social media posts. We're talking about our emails, not just what we say. All of that's included. All right, now with that in mind, what are the principles? First of all, we can choose to be gracious with our words because we have received grace. Let your speech always be gracious. That leaves no room for being ugly with somebody. Always. That means every time. You don't have to respond harshly. In fact, we're going to look in a minute where that comes from. 
Be gracious. And the reason you can be gracious is because you've received grace. Imagine if God responded to us the way we respond to people when they bother us or get on our nerves. And believe me, we get, if God has nerves, we get on his nerves, I'm sure. But he responds graciously. My prayer is that God would help me more than I do. To always be gracious. I used to joke around that my spiritual gift was sarcasm. And the Lord burdened me about that and convicted me about that. Sarcasm is not a spiritual gift. Sarcasm is a sin. Sarcasm is being brutal. Sarcasm is using your words to cut. Sarcasm is not wholesome communication proceeding out of my mouth, building up instead of tearing down. So we can be gracious because we receive grace. Second principle is this. Our speech should be flavored with the gospel. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. Salt in rabbinic literature always referred to wisdom. So in a sense, you're talking about, again, practical application of truth. Salting something meant you included the wisdom, that there was wisdom in what you were saying. But in the New Testament, most of the time, salt refers to influence. So what Paul is saying is that we speak the truths of the gospel, that's the wisdom, into everyday practical living in a very palatable way. As we encourage people, we encourage them with gospel truth. We encourage them with the work that Christ has done on their behalf. And then one-third principle, and that's this. How we say is as important, maybe even more important, than what we say. You can say the right thing, but if you say it the wrong way or at the wrong time, or if it's not yours to say, you can do more damage than good. As I said earlier, there's never an excuse to verbally respond to somebody harshly. Our grace, our, our, our speech is always seasoned with grace. We should know how we ought to answer each person. The how involves not just the content, but the manner in which it is spoken. Galatians 5, 23 gives us the fruit of the Spirit. Primarily the fruit, three things that, that, that affect our speech and the fruit of the Spirit is kindness, gentleness, and self-control. So whenever we speak something that is unkind, whenever we speak something that is not gentle, whenever we are out of control in our speak, speech and we just lash out to somebody, that's not the Spirit. That's not the Spirit. That's the flesh. So we ask God, because Christ is in us, because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we ask Him to help us speak how we are. Let me give you a little equation. How equals content plus timing plus tone. You know about how you speak. That's your content, the timing of what you're saying, and the tone with which you say it. Because of our identity in Christ, we are enabled to speak graciously. And let me just encourage you to, one last thing, to think before you speak. Use the words, or excuse me, the letters for the word think as a, an acrostic. T stands for true. Is what I'm about to say true? True. For some people, that would eliminate about 75% of their conversation. It may be true, but it may not be true. They don't know. They're just gossiping. They're just assuming it's true. Is what I'm about to say true? Is this truth? The H stands for helpful. Is what I'm about to say going to be helpful? Or is it going to be hurtful? In saying this truth... Saying it when I'm saying it, is this going to help the situation or is this pouring gas on the fire? Some of us are 
pyromaniacs, we like the fire. So we like to add fuel to the fire with our words. Is it helpful? The I stands for inspiring. Is, is what I'm going to say going to motivate or inspire someone uh, to, to want to love Jesus more because I said this? The N stands for necessary. Do I really need to say this? Does this need to be said? And does it need to be me saying it? And, and does it need to be said now? Is it necessary? And the K stands for kind. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? So you see, our identity in Christ, living from the inside out, means living this identity of Christ in us. He, in this, he wants to enable us in our work, in our prayers, in our actions, in our words. The Holy Spirit is living inside of us to generate a more gospel-centered and a more Christ-honoring picture of what the gospel is. Two final applications I'll leave you with. First of all, through our identity with Christ, know that the Holy Spirit does that. He enables us to live outwardly in light of his work inwardly. That's why we call this living inside out. God has worked in us, and so we can work. We can let what has happened in us show on the outside. Here's the one I want you to remember. Go about your daily activity knowing whose you are and who you are. Know whose you are, you belong to Christ. And know who you are, you are a redeemed, blessed, loved, grace-showered child of God. Know whose you are, know who you are, live accordingly. Pray accordingly. Act accordingly. Speak accordingly. Whose you are and who you are. Christ in you is your hope of glory.